I'm very pleased to welcome Daniel Payne as the speaker for today's event. So Daniel is the politics curator at LSE Library, he currently works on engagement work with the archives and special collections, working on exhibitions, archive workshops, and connecting people with the archives and special collections. And he's gonna share with us today a project he's been working on to help raise the profile of so-called hidden parts of the collections in response to an analysis of the library's flagship collections. So over to you, Daniel, and look forward to have a conversation after your presentation. Okay, yeah, so uh, thanks very much for coming. Um... So I'm going to talk about um, a project I've been working on over the last um, couple of years. I'm going to try and do a mix of like freestyling it whilst also reading notes at the same time. So we'll see how that 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 kind of plays out. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, the first is to introduce you to Ambedkar, Bimrao Ramji Ambedkar, who some of you may have heard of, some of you may not. Um, and then secondly, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, some thoughts I have about the way we present our collections, our archive collections in particular, to the world. Um, I was preparing for this talk and thinking that I might have possibly overthought this section a little bit, but then when we get to the third section, I'm going to try and give 10 practical suggestions for how to work with hidden collections. So hopefully it should be worth it in the end if you stick around. So um, I'll move straight to the first section and introduce you to Ambedkar. Uh, so this is a photograph of um, a bronze bust of Ambedkar, who's on display uh, in a campus building um, at LSE where I work. And this was donated to LSE in the 1950s by uh, the fabulously acronymed FABO, which stands for uh, Federation of Ambedkarite and Buddhist Organizations. Um, so Ambedkar was born in 1891 in India to a poor family. And it was part of the Dalit community, which has historically and pejoratively been referred to as the untouchables, considered to be so low in the social hierarchy so as to sit outside of the caste system and because of that he suffered extreme discrimination and segregation throughout his life he's talked about it in lots of different places but he speaks about how the touch of a Dalit person can be seen to be polluting and how at school he wouldn't be um, allowed to drink from the same water fountain for example um, and he spent his life campaigning for the representation and rights of um, Dalit communities. If you're interested in reading a bit more of some of the stuff he's written, I recommend Annihilation of Caste. It's quite a short text and it's quite a sort of readable text um, if you want to sort of weigh into his thinking. Um, later on in life, he started studying different world religions to see if there was one that would be the most appropriate to convert to, to convert out of the, the caste system. Uh, and shortly before his death, he converted to Buddhism, and many people today still convert to Buddhism um, in his name. And so that's why we have the, the bust from Favos of Mark Ambedkar's connection to Buddhism and the LSE. Um, the LSE connection is that um, he came to study here in 1916. Um, this was, uh, he was a ridiculously well-qualified person. So he already had a doctorate from Columbia, Columbia University when he came here to register for the master's degree. He simultaneously registers at um, Gray's Inn to study for the legal bar practice course. Um, his master's degree here was interrupted because the terms of his scholarship meant that he had to go back to India. Um, and he sent his some of his library and possessions and some of his master's degree thesis in a separate boat. And that got torpedoed by a German submarine. So he lost a lot of his work and possessions. Um, some years later, he then came back to the LSE to do a, a doctorate, a PhD, um, technically a DSC. Don't ask me what the difference of those are. I'd started to read it up and I don't fully understand it. Uh, but he got his um, PhD here uh, called The Problem of the Rupee. So sort of technical thesis about um, currency. Uh, and we have a copy with a handwritten dedication from Ambedkar. So it reads uh, to Professor Edwin Cannon, his supervisor, as a token of sincere regards and gratitude from this pupil, the author. So that was a um, hundred years ago this year. Um, so as well as we have, we have the bust, we have that portrait. Uh, sorry, we have the bust, we have that PhD thesis, and we have this portrait, which was donated in the 1970s. You'll see in his um, left hand, there's a copy of the Indian constitution. So as well as campaigning for Dalit rights and representation, he was also a legal scholar and is known as the chief architect of the Indian constitution. So he chaired uh, the group of people that wrote the first um, independent Indian constitution. So 
he did a lot of things. Um, and I first encountered him when I started this job as a curator at the library, where I, I would start to get inquiries about him from people just wanting to know what we had in our archives that spoke about him, because he was here for quite a few years and is such a significant and meaningful figure to lots of people. Um, and just people desperate to, to find traces of him in our collections. And we don't have that much. Um, and I, in fact, I had never even heard of him when I first received inquiries about him. And I did what many library people do is that I would then research who he was and then reply as if I'd already always known exactly who Anvedka was. Um, but I consistently get inquiries about it. And I became interested in the way when you are presented with these holes in your collection, these silences, is it enough to just sort of say there isn't really that much and just to end it there? And it was a kind of a question that sort of um, has occurred to me, in particularly in relation to um, Ambedco. So um, now onto the overthinking section. <laughs> so uh, I often encounter in the reading room a particular situation, which I think I put in the blurb of the talk. I think it's quite a sort of common comment from users of our archive collections, where they'll say something along the lines of, why have you uh, catalogued this particular collection in this particular way? It doesn't make logical sense to me. Um, why are the photographs by date? It would be better for location because my research is looking at location, so it's it's not actually helpful. And we, we get this kind of um, comment from people. And that sort of led me to think a bit about um, how we present these archive collections. Um, here is a really bad picture of a tree. I spent absolutely ages trying to find on the internet a picture of a tree that is a trunk with three branches that splits off into three, that splits off into three, and it does not exist. If anyone can find it, please email me. I even used AI to try and get it to construct a tree like that, and it wouldn't do it. So I gave up and drew this terrible picture. Um, but just to sort of generally speak about it, and to reiterate also that I'm not actually a, an archivist. I work with archives, but I'm not an archivist. So this is just my understanding of sort of archive cataloging. But the way archive collections are catalogued is a tree-like structure and very hierarchical. Um, so for example, in our archives, we have the papers of George Lansbury, who was a Labour MP in the 1930s. It's a quick picture of him in a nice hat on a motorbike. Um, you have his papers. And so that represents sort of the trunk, the heart of the collection It's the George Lansbury papers. And then everything else in that collection is catalogued in reference to the fact that they are George Lansbury's papers. So at the second level are series of things that are in the George Lansbury papers. Um, at the third level are um, files of things in George Lansbury papers. And then finally, number four are the individual items that appear in those files. And everything sort of comes back to the fact that it's the George Lansbury papers. Um, and it's a sort of obvious and also like cheesy point, but the researcher, they're not generally most of the time coming to look at the tree. Like most people don't want to come and like read the entirety of George Lansbury's papers. Instead, they're coming to look at the, the flowers that are kind of missing from this, this tree, that the leaves, the actual words that appear on those items. And this kind of tree-like structure is to, to guide them towards it, um, but it doesn't actually appear on the catalogue. Likewise, it's not that the researcher um, comes to see all of the flowers on that tree, but they might need one flower from this tree, one flower from another tree, one flower from another tree. And so the researcher has quite a difficult task on their hands because they're presented with this structure, this tree-like structure, which they have to sort of use to get access to it, whilst at the same time kind of deconstruct it and build their own structure that's based around their research question, if that makes sense. So um, it's not a, a, a critique of archive catalog, but just pointing out an effect of it, which is that it's a bit of a double-edged sword, essential for access, um, but can sometimes um, exclude the stuff that the person is actually looking for or, or makes it hard, makes it sort of sort of hidden, that kind of thing. Um, so really, I was just mentioning that to say that I think um, engagement work is absolutely essential alongside cataloging work. The two have to work together in order to kind of expose these hidden collections. Um, I know that when I sort of approach um, archive collections. I don't think of collections, I think of stories. 
Uh, and I think probably researchers also think of stories and probably most people who are not a library or archive person thinks about the stories that they're looking for rather than archive collections. And bless you, Alison. <laughs> um, uh, so um, it just got me thinking just a little bit about this, this, this kind of tree and, and what kind of effects this causes and how it kind of hides, hides collections in some kind of ways. But um, yeah, that's not very succinct, but just some, a few sort of thoughts that I was thinking about it. Um, so I'm going to move away from the horrible tree to the um, third section where I'm actually going to talk about the projects that I've been working on, Traces of South Asia. So um, at its heart, um, the project is just simply a website on the library webpage, which serves as a hub to share these stories that relate to South Asia, share engagement work and all the kinds of activities that I'm doing and in partnership with other people to help raise the profile of this particular hidden collection, because we don't really have a South Asia collection as such. There's no kind of tree trunk that we can present to people and say, this is the South Asia collection. So instead, this project is a sort of way of artificially constructing a, a collection that doesn't fit into a sort of normal structure. It's composed of lots and lots of different little bits and lots of different collections, not just archives, but spread about and within other people's papers, which makes them somewhat hidden um, because of their different structure. Um, so here are just 10 things that I've been working on the last couple of years that I thought I would um, share. So the first is digitization. So um, we have a, we're lucky to have a digitization suite in-house in the library. And typically when we digitize things, I don't know if it's similar at other places, but in terms of selection, it's relatively straightforward. So we're gonna digitize this person's papers, the George Lansbury papers, then you just digitize all the papers or a particular series of journals or that kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to hidden collections in South Asia, um, digitizing can actually um, bring together all these disparate little bits that appear in different collect collections and then bring them together into their own more visible collection, if that makes sense. So I've been working on a South Asia digitization project. The selection for it is a lot more complicated because it involves trying to follow threads of stories in lots of different places. Um, to give an example, this particular photograph is on the list for digitization. Um, so this photograph comes from the papers of Agnes Maud Royden, who was a suffragist and campaigner for the movement for the ordination of women. Um, and it just happens that in her collection, there is this one photograph of her with Gandhi. So she's she's at the center. And then to her uh, left is Aruna Asaf Ali, who was a very significant figure in the Indian independence movement. And to her left is Mira Ben, who's another very interesting person involved in the Indian independence movement. And I've shared lots of stories about her um, kind of elsewhere. Uh, and her story, Mira Ben, is explained a little bit more in another random place in our collections, actually in the George Lansbury papers. Um, so instead of digitizing Agnes Maud Royden's all papers, they're just digitizing this one photograph and one item from somewhere else. And together, they'll start to build um, a collection of stories that relate to South Asia and so become their own kind of, I don't know, artificially constructed collection rather than a sort of obvious collection of this person's papers kind of thing. Um, and also to because it's in lots of disparate places, not just focusing on um, digitizing archives, also other parts of our collection. So as a part of this project in our main collection, we have various government publications from um, South Asia. So we're digitizing some of those. And there are some pamphlets in the women's library that, that relate to um, South Asia. So um, looking at all different parts of the collection and bringing them together to join the thread of um, different stories. That's digitization. Um, the second thing is exhibitions. So um, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but an exhibition is a really great way of exploring hidden collections and helping to promote them. Uh, so this is an exhibition I did about um, journeys to independence, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Previously, we didn't really think of ourselves as a library that had anything that really spoke about South Asia. But if you follow the threads of different stories, you can just about bring enough that does actually create a meaningful story that, that people um, interact with. And I'd also say that 
to help with hidden collections. You don't have to focus an exhibition on pure archive items. I've got books from the main collection that are on display in that exhibition. I realized I needed a nice um, illustrated um, copy of the constitution to sort of finish telling a story. So I just printed it off the internet and put it in a cabinet. So I, I think you can be quite, um, you don't have to focus on an exhibition thinking it has to be sort of pure rare um, archives. Um, and this was a really great way also to partner up with other people if your library is attached to a university. So I partnered up with um, academics who are interested in this topic. So they really enjoyed getting involved in it because it relates to their research. And I benefited from their sort of expertise because I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, so it's a really sort of great opportunity and it had a really nice impact, this exhibition. Um, I'll just read out some comments. So as an Indian at LSE, it's incredible that a non-British perspective is being presented. It makes me proud. Uh, I can't read it all now because I'm covered up by myself. It makes me proud to be at LSE and be an Indian. The British Bangladeshi, I found it emotional and heartwarming exploring this exhibition. And then my favorite comment is, thank you so much, Ambedkar, for everything. And then the name and eight years old. Um, also hope you had a good life reading and studying in the library. Um, so I, I really like doing physical exhibitions. Um, when I thought about this, I thought lots of people will say, oh, that's very well if you have a gallery space. Lots of people won't have a gallery space in their library. Um, as well as doing like quite simple pop-up exhibitions, I actually think um, you could do an exhibition on a blank wall. If your library has a wall, <laughs> I assume it does. Um, I think you can do an exhibition. An exhibition does not have to be some enormous British museum affair. If you have a wall that you can stick some pictures and some text and in some way make it inter interactive or, or a way for people to respond to it, which could just be organizing some event related to it. And um, in my view, at least that counts as an exhibition. So there are sort of low budget ways to do it that don't involve having to have a gallery uh, and you can call it an exhibition, I think. Um, yes, that's everything for that. Exhibitions, uh, online exhibitions. Um, so uh, I really like doing online exhibitions as well because um, they're relatively easy to do. Um, we've done three so far related to South Asia where we've shared some of the stories in the collection and helped to raise the profile of these collections. So on the left, I did one called Educate, Agitate, Organize, which is all about Ambedkar's time at LSE. So I mentioned at the beginning, I felt a bit um, um, rubbish about just being replying to people saying, well, there's just this bust, there's some administrative files, that kind of thing. But now we have an exhibition where we've shared all of that material, and then also written a kind of narrative story and kind of filled in some of the blanks. And so kind of, uh, in a way, added a bit to the collection. Um, so I think it's a really nice thing to be able to share. Uh, likewise, my colleague, Gillian Murphy on the right, she um, picked out some stories to do with women in South Asia. Uh, and in particular, did an exhibition about, about the um, Myra Saad Brown Memorial Library. So previously, her, her name just appeared on some of the book plates in our um, collections in the Women's Library, but we didn't really talk about the fact that we had a Myra Saad Brown Memorial Library. But now that Gillian has done this online exhibition, it, it's drawn out that collection and given it um, more of a profile. Again, I was thinking of people who were um, listening to this, they might say, oh, I can't do an online exhibition because you need like a sort of jazzy website or like exhibition software or that kind of thing. Um, but our online exhibitions, are um, ju they're just websites with um, picture and text. There's nothing particularly fancy about them in that regard. Um, so it's it's um, if, you, if you've got the technical capability to do a blog post, you can do an online exhibition. I was also thinking people might think, well, we don't have a digitization suite, so we can't provide sort of good images for it. I would say that the forget about preservation when it comes to online exhibitions, it's not about preservation, it's 100% about access. So you could take a photograph on your phone of an object in your library or scan something, and that's fine as far as I'm concerned, because people are there to read a story and see these items. Um, and then the other thing I thought people might say, no, I can't do an online exhibition is because they might say, well, um, I'm not like a curator. I don't know how to write text to sort of curate an exhibition. Um, I actually meant to look this up beforehand and I forgot to do it. But I assume the word curator is related to the word care. So as long as you care about the thing that you're exhibiting, that's sufficient 
knowledge and skill to curate an online exhibition. So I think it's quite an easy thing to do if you have um, a great web editor. So and shout out to um, Andy Jack, who's our web editor, who's always up for kind of experimenting with, with the website to sort of help with engagement with our collections and that kind of thing. Uh, um, so our archives are open to everyone, as I think they are at most libraries. Um, typically, someone will have to book an appointment or register, fetch material and that kind of thing. So it's um, not quite as easy as just sort of wandering in, but, but they're, they're, they're open to everyone. Um, in spite of that, I think lots of people, when it comes to archives and even library collections in general, they might think that coming to look at this kind of stuff is the preserve only of a sort of proper academic or historian. And so just don't assume that they can come in and do that. So in my view, we can't just say things like everything is open, you can book an appointment. We also have to bring archives out to two people. Um, so this is uh, a photograph from an archive drop-in. So it's quite a simple thing to organize and we do them quite regularly. We started doing them uh, last year, I think, where we just get a bunch of stuff out from the archives on a particular theme. Um, so I did one about um, South Asia for South Asian Heritage Month last year. This isn't a picture from that particular one. Um, and then we just, for three hours, we just advertise this informal, just drop in if you're nearby and come and see it. And at the South Asia Heritage Month one, it was really popular. And I spoke to loads of people, the majority of which weren't sort of academics or people researching archives. They were just, they'd, they'd never engaged with archives, were interested in stuff to do with South Asia, and were just really excited to sort of touch things. And I think this was really a kind of valuable experience that we're going to sort of carry on doing. Um, last Sunday, it was the anniversary of Ambedkar's birth. It was his birthday, otherwise known as. Um, and uh, so I just again, again did a very similar thing where I just said in the library, I'll get a few things out about them on a table, come in and see it. And literally hundreds of people turned up to come in and have a look at Ambedkar's uh, material. It was a really like extraordinary event and full of um, people like reading. I saw this child who asked me, um, I showed you that PhD thesis, but they hadn't written um, dedication. He asked me, oh, was that? written by Anne Bedker, I said, yes, it was. And he sort of climbed onto the desk and then put his whole head in the thesis and just sniffed it, which I thought was like really cool. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a really sort of, I think we have to bring archives out, not just um, help people access them, but bring them to people. Um, last Saturday, actually, um, so it was a busy weekend, last weekend. Um, I also tried to keep in touch with what's going on in the university um, that's attached to the library because um, chances are there will be some academic or student that's interested in, in the parts of your hidden collection. Um, so I found that there was this conference going on with the Inequalities Institute that had partnered up with the University of Mumbai. And they were having a conference and I thought perhaps they'd be interested in some of this stuff. And then the whole conference came to the library to have a look at some of the stuff that I got out. So um, yeah, bringing archives out is uh, important, um, particularly with hidden collections to sort of help people know about them. Uh, first, so this might be um, another example of overthinking, um, but I, th I was thinking about the library and if you forget about um, collections completely and just think about the library as an entity, like the, the physical and online library, um, since the library has existed, there have been so many people that have spent time in the library, have passed through it, a student studying in it, um, someone popping into the toilet, um, a member of staff that's been there forever. There are just people that have experienced life there. Life has happened in the library. And there's absolutely no trace of that other than locked in the, the memories and possessions of those people that have passed through it and spent that time in the library. And unless, that person ends up becoming very famous and decides to donate their archives to you. It's a kind of, uh, I see that as a kind of a collection that the library has, kind of like the ultimate hidden collection of these, these people that have spent time in the library. And I think that that's something that we can engage with as a library. So to give a practical example, <laughs> that's something quite esoteric. Um, 
I got this uh, inquiry from someone in India whose father had recently died. Um, and they were sort of going through their possessions and trying to find out more about their father's life, which I think is what kind of quite often happens. Um, and they knew that their father had studied at LSE. So they were asking, getting in touch with us to see if we had anything um, about it. And we had a kind of student file which had like his application form and a few um, bits and pieces in it. So I sent it to him um, and then he replied, I just... I have to move myself out of the way so I can read this. There we go. Uh, I'll just read the second paragraph. So he replied to me saying, his, referring to his father, he said his, his going to LSE has changed the lives of an entire generation and the second generation. Seeing a student file has brought my family a deluge of happiness. We can't wipe our tears enough. Our mum wants to touch these pages. I was really moved in particular by that last sentence. And I just ended up replying to him and chatting to him and he started sending me like more pictures um from his father's so this is a, a picture with his wife um and then i noticed that he was um but by, by sharing his memories he was annotating the student file and sort of um embellishing it and in a way adding to the collection so i asked him if he wanted to sort of um share this more publicly and so we co-wrote a blog post together where I kind of wrote a bit about the administrative document. And then he ha added his sort of layers of memories of what it was actually like for his father at LSC, like not what the administrative record said. So the record would say, oh, he didn't turn up to class for six months or something. But then his son was saying, well, that was because he ran out of money. So he had to go and work in the post office so he can continue with his studies. Um, so in a way, the sort of added to the collection. Um, so yeah, I think seeing the people that have spent time in your library as a potential collection is something that I find interesting and um, is something that I'm just sort of trying to explore. I'm just checking how long I've been talking for. Okay, 11.30. Uh, so um, I also think um, engaging in original research um, is a great way to expose hidden collections. Um, so I was trying to see if there's anything more about Ambedka, like desperately trying to buy more things. Um, and because of my library and archive background, not because of my academic or historian background, I knew that archive catalogues often reproduce um, original terms that are found in documents that could be considered to be discriminatory or offensive today. So instead of searching for Dalits, which I'd done previously, I searched for untouchable, um, found this letter from a director at the library about this previous student. And it's an extremely long-winded story that's on the Traces of South Asia website. So I won't share it now, but I'd encourage you to read it. But in a very long-winded way, I end, ended up discovering a letter by Ambedkar that we had in the collections that was otherwise hidden. Uh, so I think that was like a contribution to scholarship of the kind, because it's a new thing. And that wasn't as a result of being an academic, it's a result of being a library and archive person. So I think we as library and archive persons are a different kind of expert on our collections and we can sort of contribute to um scholarship and sort of sharing hidden collections um but yeah I, it's, uh, I just recommend reading the exhibition you'll understand a bit more about it um this one's quite a straightforward one but um organizing talks and public events that are related to the subjects of your hidden collections and then bringing those hidden collections to those events. So, um, I mean, we have a regular schedule of um, public events, but are focused um, doing quite a few events on um, topics of South Asia and just putting them on YouTube afterwards so that um, it all helps with them spreading the word about the collection. Um, what your business is up to. So a little bit similar to the um, ghosts bit I was talking about. Um, people come to our library and use our collections and the vast majority of the time they use them for whatever purpose and then you never hear from them again. Um, particularly with archives, you'll only hear from them really if they took a photograph of something and they have a question about copyrights because they're going to publish it in an article. Um, but it occurred to me that um, there would be lots of people that have actually found these hidden collections and have been using them and we just don't know about them. So in a kind of I thought about this randomly on a Monday morning and then just printed off a Word document that just said, hi, I'm Daniel, I'm interested in South Asia. Um, 
and who are using those those collections. I'd have to chat about it if you're in our li library using this stuff and just left it in the reading room. And I had quite a few people get in touch with me about it. Um, one guy who was doing his PhD in Switzerland, he was here in the archives reading room as a result of our Traces of South Asia work um, because I had previously um, written a post saying, oh, inside this person's archives, you wouldn't think it, but actually there's quite a bit about the Bangladeshi diaspora in the East End. And um, this person had read that, and that was the subject of his PhD. So he came over to look at those archives. And then from chatting to him, um, I then put him in touch with some other colleagues, and then he wrote a blog post about it. So it was great for everyone because uh, he got to sort of think out loud at a stage of his research and share about it. And it just continues to help the, um, with sharing about these hidden collections and shows that they are hidden because this person doing a PhD just did not know that we had this, that stuff, but um, they now do. Uh, that's just a photograph from one of the, the items that he was looking at. So it's um, the papers of Peter Shaw, another Labour MP, who's pictured on the left, uh, but he took an interest in Bangladeshi independence movement. And on the right is Bangabandhu, the first, uh, I think it's prime minister, not president, prime minister of um, Bangladesh. And then finally, like, uh, not finally, um, penultimately, uh, training and resources. So on the Traces of South Asia site, just written a very simple kind of list of um, some collections that I've come across that relate to South Asia, just to sort of get it out there. I do think um, one thing to be interesting to be ex to explore is these people that come to look at the stories and come to research their ar our archives. Um, I don't think it's enough to give like a sort of how do I search guide, like how how do you enter terms into this field and that kind of thing. I think actually they need to know a bit more about sort of intellectually how collections are organized and how they're presented to them, because as, as we've discussed, that's how they can sort of help find things. So there's something on kind of training and exposing the work of the cataloger um, to the, the user of the archive that I think would be worth um, exploring. Um, and then just finally being public about it. So I mentioned Andy Jack, he was very up for just doing a website, our web editor. Uh, and then we just sort of add stuff to it and think out loud about it. So we explain on the website um, what we're trying to do. And if anyone has any suggestions to sort of um, get in touch with us. Um, I wasn't brave enough to do like a live website demo. So this is just a screenshot of the top of the page. Um, and I know you can't click that link, but if you Google LSE library traces of South Asia, uh, you'll be able to find it. Um, but yeah, that's the, the web page. And then I'm not really sure what to, to do next with it, which is why I thought it'd be really interesting in the discussion if people had suggestions for other ways to um, raise the profile of hidden collections and how to sort of let people know about them. Um, I'm quite interested in oral histories um, because of some of the things I've talked about, people's kind of memories is quite an interesting collection to, to grow and sort of add to the holes that might appear in um, hidden collections. Um, and then radical access as well. Um, so much of what the researcher ends up seeing is in a way controlled by us because there's the catalogue that controls it. There's how many items they can fetch per day when they come here that controls it, that our opening hours, all this kind of thing, um, which all are kind of they're necessary, but they also serve to keep collections hidden, which are already kind of physically hidden because they're locked in a store. Um, so there's, there's something about accessing archives that I think is important to think about with regards to hidden collections, but I'm not quite sure what. Um, and Yes, that, I just seemed, felt like I spoke very quickly. Um, but yes, that was everything I wanted to mention. And I'm really happy to chat about it if anyone wants to, to email me. Um, in the extremely unlikely event, anyone is on Mastodon. I put my Mastodon username on there. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Daniel. That was great. I think, you know, the idea of trying to find different ways to surface the stories that exist in your collections is really appealing. Um, there's some questions come in on the chat, um, one of which was when you were putting together, you, you know, your exhibitions online or in person, did you, were you able to include different voices, different perspectives in your description of the objects? Yeah, so um, I always consciously when doing exhibitions, try to 
get the the voices of the people who the objects are about to speak. So I'm often ending up being the sort of coordinator, but the text is often written by other people. Um, so yeah, it's something I sort of consciously try to do with um, exhibitions. I think it's important. And also to get, um, sorry, um, but also for um, the visitors to the exhibition to also add their voice to it, there has to be a mechanism for that as well, so that um, you're not presenting this sort of authoritative narration of events, but people can add to it and bring their own perspectives. And when you're doing that, not necessarily the visitors, but when you're doing that in advance, the preparation of a, of a piece of engagement work, how do you identify the community to involve in that descriptive work? And perhaps also, how do you manage the kind of almost built in power imbalance that you are the curator and you have a lot of the power over these collections? How do you how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a huge thing. <laughs> Um, so the Ambedkar online exhibition, for example, um, I partnered up with the Decolonizing Collective and um, academics from and who also write about South Asia. Um, it is true that it's inescapable that the curator, yeah, it's, it's difficult because I don't think there is a solution to that that, that resolves it. There's no way to, um, you have to sort of be aware of that power that you do inevitably have. Um, so for example, with the Journeys to Independence in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh exhibition, um, I was very aware that a lot of the archives that we have are the archives of British people based in the UK that contain stuff about, about South Asia, but it's not the archives of people who are in South Asia. Um, and so that's a kind of sort of power structure that I think um, one way of dealing with it is just to reveal that. So at the exhibition, I had a huge poster that prefixed everything that pointed this out and encouraged people to think like, what is the effect of the facts that we're telling this story, but with these archives that come from a British perspective, um, there might be other solutions to doing that. But I think um, being honest and self-aware of it and sort of sharing that in the exhibition is, is, is part of it. One of the other questions that came up is, is a sort of more practical one, which is um, given these archives are, are fairly modern in, in quite a lot of terms, did you have any um, copyright or permission problems when you wanted to put some of this material up online? Yeah, so with um, copyright, we take a risk managed approach. So um, we sort of have a takedown policy. So if anyone is um, getting in touch with the original copyright holder, we would by default um, take it down. It's um, we, we tend to avoid doing exhibitions on much more recent themes because of the increased risk. So it tends to be older stuff like early 20th century. Um, but yeah, I, I would say we take a sort of risk managed approach. We don't necessarily to identify the copyright owners of every single thing that we put online and try and ask permission because it's not practically possible um and yeah we have uh, one of the things that makes that risk managed approach possible is that it's supported by the sort of library leadership team they're, they're prepared to take on a bit of risk we do a full copyright risk assessment when we do this kind of thing and yeah uh one of the other questions that's come up is um, this sort of tension between archival cataloging pro approaches, which I think you're sort of suggesting in some ways are contributing to keeping some of these collections hidden, just the, the way that they're structured is, is contributing to keeping them hidden. And the question asks, you know, is there anything we can do within the catalogues to embed some of the uncovering work or does it have to be outside that descriptive practice? I think so. the long-winded second section was much longer, which probably would have been better. <laughs> But um, I think because the archivist has to provide a summary of what's involved in the, 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 the items, it has to be a summary. And there's no avoiding the fact that when we summarize, we exclude. Like that's not a, a critique of it. It's just pointing out the effect that summaries exclude. And to give some examples, for example, I was looking at an archive collection that we had about the South Sea Company, which was like a sort of ship trading um, and I read the whole description and had to look at the files and I had no idea until I researched separately that what it traded in was enslaved people, but this was just not written in the description. And I think this is particularly true of um, collections that have been catalogued quite a long time ago, I think. Um, sorry, I've forgotten what the actual question was. What can we do about that? I, <laughs> was yeah, I guess, how can we embed some of that 
opening up and covering work in our descriptive practice of archives? Yeah, so I, I feel like um, there's lots and lots of archivists already that sort of work on this practice, and I feel like I'm I'm straying outside of my area. But archivists do this work. I mean, is they they try to make sure that their summary descriptions are more inclusive. I guess it's just to say it doesn't matter how inclusive your summary description is; it has to involve exclusion. So it's just um, pointing out that it's something that we have to work with, and I think engagement is one of the ways to do that. All the engagement activities that. Are, Mentioning. And I think you also mentioned that training, that building understanding in our users about the descriptive practices we use and how they might need to interact with them or interrogate, you know, to find what they're really looking for. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think researchers don't know how things are organised, and I just think it would be enormously helpful if they if they did know. Yeah, one of the questions is asked about how how to deal with a user who might be opposed to how a particular collection has been organized and might have other suggestions. I don't know whether there are examples of, you know, competing uh, competing descriptions existing in the one catalog. Yeah, it's not something um, I've experienced. I mean, again, I don't do the actual practical work of cataloging. I tried it once and found it very difficult to do. Um, but yeah, so I, I work on more of the engagement side of things. So it's not something that I've um, experienced, I think. Um, I'm sure there'll be archivists in the in the chat that could um share that. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to ask as well. You you talked about you know this has obviously been a bit of work that's been going on. I think 2017 was the first exhibition. Is that right? So it's yeah. been a, a a multi multi year commitment to this work. Um, has it resulted in new collections coming to the LSE? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Not on the topic of South Asia, uh, it hasn't. Um, but our engagement work more generally, at, uh, I mean, the activities that I've described are things that I also do with other collections as well. Um, and they have absolutely led to new acquisitions. I think it's it's a bit harder with something like South Asia because um, the collections of people in South Asia doing work in South Asia will quite correctly reside in South Asia. Um, but yeah, there's there's not, again, it could be the case that we, in some of our acquisitions, it might contain like a one-off document that is something about South Asia. It, it's hard, there's no kind of South Asia donation, if that makes sense, but our engagement work does lead to donations of various archives that might contain further stories about South Asia that are yet to be discovered. Yeah. Actually, I suppose the, the information you gathered from the son of the graduate is part now of the Institutional Archive of LSE, and it's part of the record yeah. of what it was like to be a student. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah good. Um, we did have a question about what um, software you used for your online exhibition. Uh, so no software. So it's um, a web editor. However, he it's just a, a normal web page. That There's no software. It's just... Um, a basic web page so just like a blog post it's text and pictures and that's it yeah um and i wanted to ask us all about the sort of the radical access idea are you, are you talking about that sort of sense of allowing people to try to engage with the archives outside of cataloging descriptions and outside of you know traditional so basically come in and walk the shelves and you know, browse amongst the material without the organizing structure of the catalog. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned power earlier on because we have power in so many different ways, the way we describe collections and the way we enable access to them. Even like saying we can fetch you just three items a day is is a is a, an expression of power of some kind. And I'm not saying any of these things are unnecessary. There has to be some organization and in, in, in getting access to archives. Um, but th there are so many different ways in which we um, control what the person ends up seeing. Um, and so I'm just arguing from uh, outside the sort of, because I'm not involved in the sort of physical access kind of thing, that doing this kind of engagement work can perhaps help that a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's a sort of open-ended thought. Like I'm curious to hear what other people think if there's any way that access to ar archives can be rethought about in a way that still enables them to be preserved. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly at the National Library of Scotland, we've had some really interesting, you know, work doing co-curated exhibitions with community groups where, you know, it, it is the community that decides the story and decides the selection of material. Um, and the curators are, are meant to be the facilitators to that. But there is still that sense of you're still having to be a, a bit of a gatekeeper, a bit of a facilitator. Um, yeah. yeah. There are places, I think like Mayday Rooms in London, there are places where the, the, the community that donates the archive are also the ones that catalogue it or are involved in cataloguing it. Mm -hmm. And um, I've mentioned oral histories as well. So what I've been interested in doing recently is when a archive collection is donated to us and it's been catalogued and organised, then do the oral history with the person that donated it, asking them what they think about the structure and how it feels like to be there. And that, that's kind of another way of sort of um, dealing with that control that we've now had over the collection is to sort of make sure that what is also recorded is what that donor thinks about all of that. Mm -hmm.